Hi and welcome. Today I'm going to talk about one common huge problem that I see a lot of people do when I mean, they're trying to construct a master curve for time temperature superposition. So here's a problem I'm interested in. I, I have a material that I really want to know how much does it relax over a very long time. So I want to have a curve that looks like this, but I can't measure it very easily because I can't use a test machine for over days or months or even years to, to actually measure the amount of stress relaxation. I need to use some other technique to be able to predict the stress relaxation over very long times. So what people often do is that they use a DMA uh, test instead. So I can take this material, I can run a frequency sweep at, at the temperature of interest, which in this case is room temperature, I can measure the storage modulus, I can measure the loss modulus as a function of frequency. And my DMA machine is accurate over a relatively narrow range of frequencies. So in this case, about 0 0.1 up to say 20 uh, on the frequency scale. And that's just not enough to create the master curve or predict a really long term response. But what I can do and what people often do is that I repeat that frequency sweep at different temperatures. So if you look at the figure to the left here, this is storage modulus versus frequency. The green curve is the room temperature. And then I did two higher temperatures and two lower temperatures. And on the figure to the right looks a little messier. That's the loss modulus. So let's focus on the storage modulus on the left. It looks like the curves here indicate that maybe you can shift these curves horizontally, which is the time temperature superposition idea. If I shift them properly, I should be able to get about one curve that gives me the master curve, which I then can use to predict really short-term or really long-term behaviors that are hard to measure experimentally. So, so that's what I tried. I took the data here. I then numerically shifted them to get the best fit of a single master curve. And here's kind of the, the best fit I could come up with. The frequencies goes up to 10 to the 4 or something uh, down to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4. So very wide range of frequencies, exactly what I like. Um, the curves didn't quite fit together perfectly, but you know, you get the experimental errors when you run tests. So maybe that's not so concerning. But so here's my master curve. And then take this master curve, I export it to a file and I put it into M calibration, my favorite material calibration software. And uh, here is the plot in M calibration of storage modulus versus frequency. And uh, this is what I will use for my calibration. So I can very quickly in M calibration select a linear viscoelastic material model. I can use Abacus or ANSYS or some other one. In this case, I used the Abacus. I selected the hyperelastic model and Neohookian because you don't have large strains. And the software recommended nine prony series terms because it's about nine orders of magnitude of frequencies here. And uh, then it's pretty instantaneous at predicting the, the whole prony series response in this case. And it looks like this. It looks pretty good. There's a little waviness to the curve, and that's because we perhaps should have had even more prony series terms. Maybe a larger number would smooth out this curve. But overall, it's a pretty good fit to the master curve that I created. Once I'm done with this, I now have a material model that is uh, capturing the response that I'm interested in. I can go ahead and then predict, which is what I wanted in the first place, the relaxation response of this material that I'm interested in. So this is the predicted relaxation response. It goes from this stress value at 1% strain to this stress value uh, over very long times if you keep that strain constant. So, so that's really the, what people do. But is this good? Well, it's stress relaxed 62% according to this prediction. But I can tell you now that the actual relaxation in this case should have been 39%, not 62. So the master curve approach that I just went through had an error that's close to 60%. It's terrible. It's a very inaccurate prediction of the stress relaxation response of this material. So this is what people often do. And I'm saying here that this is not always right. It's not always good. It can be very inaccurate. So how do I know all this? Well, let's take a look at what's going on here. What we're doing is we're using a linear viscoelastic material model. And a linear viscoelastic material model requires two things. It requires a stiffness. In this case, I'm using a hyperelastic model, and it requires a prony series. Both the hyperelastic response and the prony series can depend on temperature. 
And a lot of people forget that the stiffness response also depends on temperature. So what I did for my study, I actually didn't use a real material. I went and I used a numerical virtual material. I used a hyperelastic Neohookian material model with a Prony series. I used a hyperelastic model that was slightly temperature dependent. And here are the commands in Abacus style and Ansys would be the same thing. There's a slightly different stiffness depending on the temperature. But then I used the same Prony series for all temperatures with a uh, WLF scaling factor. So that's how I generated these curves. So remember when I showed you these before, this is the frequency sweeps at different temperatures. That's what I used to create the master curve. Well, we actually have information what the material model should be, the actual real material model. So I can also, if I wanted to, predict the master curve for each of these temperatures with the real material model, which is the, the true answer. See, the green curve is the room temperature and goes like this. And the other temperatures here, you see, if you try to shift them, you would not get the green curve, the green dash curve. Clearly, it's missing something. It's missing the temperature dependence of the instantaneous response of the material. So I have the answer. I can predict what the stress relaxation should have been for this material at 1% strain. Here it is. And if I compare the master curve approach in green to the actual stress relaxation response that it should be, see there's a huge difference in both really small frequencies and times or very high. So this is the common problem that I see. Just because you can't shift your experimental data if you do DMA tests doesn't mean that the so-called master curve that you generate is correct. Don't forget that the elastic response can also be temperature dependent. And this makes sense if you do a quick tension test uh, at instantaneous rate in some sense. Clearly that stiffness can be dependent on temperature too. So you shouldn't ignore that if that's part of your uh, calibration or what you're trying to do. So, so that's my lesson here today. Uh, keep this in mind as you're trying to generate your master curves. Don't ignore the, the stiffness dependence on temperature if that's important in your particular case. If you have any questions, you can ask them below.